me, Brianka J. Um, thanks for watching this video and tuning in. You know, it means the world to me. I want to just ask you before we get into all the details here, if you can go ahead and like, comment, subscribe if you are enjoying my videos and you will be tuned in to see all the wonderful analysis and recommendations and reviews. Of course, short stories that I do on a weekly basis. So if that sounds like something you're looking for, go ahead and hit the subscribe button. It means so much to me. Your girl is trying to get another check, okay? She really is. So make that happen, make that happen. We're gonna get right into the videos. Stay tuned. guys good morning it's morning for me it's actually like seven seven o'clock um I just started going back to the office so I'm back in the classroom virtually um, weird situation the kids aren't there but we're just training right now and oh my god like the transition has me so exhaustedly tired it's unreal so even when I got home yesterday, I really wanted to do this analysis of John Toomer's Corintha. And I kept looking at the camera. My body was filling the bed and the bed won, okay? But I had promised myself that when I woke up that morning before I left for work, I would take a little bit of the energy I had and go ahead and shoot this video because I love YouTube and I, I don't want to like, more balance in my life. Like I can do what I love and I can get a check and hopefully one day I can combine the two. But yeah. <clears throat> anyway, so yeah, John Toomer's uh, Kane was like a novella. Um, it written in 1920. So I'll just I'll just go through this. Um, so Corintha is an expert from the novel, right? Kane by John Toomer. He was an African American writer who was considered a leading figure in the Harlem Renaissance as well. So Toomer was raised in Washington, D.C., but he moved to Georgia in around 1920, and he taught for four years. Um, Toomer's, time, Toomer's time in the South was the source for much of his inspiration and became the foundation of his book, Cain. Cain centers around the landscape and Southern people he saw in Georgia. And so the excerpt Corintha is a coming of age story that centers around a woman who has lost her innocence and subsists um, by sexually satisfying the men around her while remaining herself very unsatisfied. And so the poem begins with an epigraph that reads, her skin is like dust on the east horizon. Oh, can't you see it? Oh, can't you see it? Her skin is like dust on the eastern horizon when the sun goes down. The first thing noted as a reader was the perspective the author chose, which was third person. The perspective offers a degree of objectivity and directs the reader's attention to the subject being presented, but withholds the subject's thoughts and feelings from the narrative. Um, the second thing the reader attains from the epigraph is the comparison between the subjects. Corinthian skin is like dusk. Um, the dusk is the space between time where there isn't necessarily light, but isn't necessarily dark. She's not necessarily black. She's not necessarily white. So it talks about her, um, her mixed heritage, her complexion, and how it was a part of what made her so desirable. So then he follows the epigraph with this prose, and it begins um, immediately offering the reader the central theme of the poem. Man had always wanted her. Corintha, even as a child. Corintha, caring beauty. Perfect at dusk when the sun goes down. Here, the reader learns two things. One is that Corintha was desirous and sexually appealing very young. Second, uh, one can infer that her desire is due to her mixed heritage and her complexion. It's her skin. Her skin is like dusk. She's not too black. She's not too white. It makes her like this, the most desirable person. And you got to remember how you, how they were doing this type of eugenic shit back then. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to curse. Where um, they were like having these quadroon balls and trying to find the perfect capacity of, of mixture, right? 
So from the next line, it says, old man rolled her hobby horse upon their knees. That's when you do the knee, you hold the baby. If you're not sure, that's how you do the hobby horse. And so um, young men danced with her at Frolics when they should have been dancing with the grown-up girls. The reader learns how early on Corinthian beauty is an attractive source for men of all ages. And they begin to sexualize her innocence, especially in reference to the hobby horse. Um, a children's tour that to be written and mimics the gallop, right? Is now a way to feed the sexual desires of older men. Tumor ends the passage with God grant us youth. Secretly pray the old men. The young fellows counted the time to pass before she would be old enough to mate with them. This interest of the male who wishes to ripen a growing thing too soon could mean no good to her. Again, Tumor is referencing to the sexual desires of these men on a child, but this time comparing, comparing it to a fruit. A fruit, as we all know, if you pick it too soon, it will spoil but well before its time. So, Tumor is now alluding to Corinthians' future and how these men and their desires will ultimately lead, lead to her demise or spoil her spirit or her soul before she is old. You know, like that loss of innocence. Like that loss of innocence, really. You know what I'm saying? And I, I, I've grown up with some girls, and it's like you, you kind of, they kind of plucked them a little early, and now you see them now, and you be like, oh, whew, Tom is a, could be a cruel, cruel, cruel beast. Anyway, the second stanza, we have two more following Corinthians through her adolescence, in which he describes her as, at 12 was a wild flash to tell other folks just what it was to live. As if to say she was much more knowledgeable than at her age than her peers were. Um, sorry. A wild flash is both unexpected and fast. As if to strike, it strikes hard. There is no coincidence that this is used to describe Corintha here. She was much quicker than her peers. Tumor further describes her nature in a kinetic fashion. He states, with the other children, one could hear some distance off their feet flopping in the two-inch dust. Because Corintha's running was a word, so she was way faster, right? This is not just her ability to run, but also a reference in how quickly the girl is growing up, right? It's not, um, Tumor also documents the trouble and mischief she causes. She stoned the cows and beats the dogs, it says, and fought the other children, as well as how she is easily forgiven for them. So he says, even the preacher who caught her at mischief told himself she was innocently as lovely as a November cotton flower. Yet another allude to her beauty, as well as the way in which men are quick to forgive her uh, due to her distraction it causes him. Tumor now reveals her sexual nature. He states in a nearly forgiving manner now um, how one could not imitate but what one's parents did, right? For it to follow as it was the way of God. She played home with a small boy who was not afraid to do her bidding. That, that, that started the whole thing. So Tumor then repeats earlier statements of the man desire for Corintha with slight rephrasing to emphasize her quickening growth and her maturity, and it says, old men could no longer ride her hobby horse upon her knees, but the young men counted her faster. So, before beginning stanza three, Tumor then restates the four line epigraph with a slight rephrasing and a quick in tempo, but it still refers to Corinthian's beauty and mixed heritage as if to emphasize that these two qualities were the source of all her troubles. Following the epigraph, Tumor makes a sort of reference to the subject matter and phrasing of earlier paragraphs. To emphasize, sorry, I'm gonna go this way. To emphasize his point, Tumor uses repetitions in, of actual sentences and phrases. I'm oh, sorry, Tumor dramatically begins, Corintha is a woman now, stated short and to the point, so not to give the reader any source of doubt. Tumor then continues by offering the reader more detail about the now adult Corintha. First, that she is still as beautiful as she ever was, perfect as dust. She who carries beauty, perfect as dust when the sun goes down. And then he says, 
Uh, however, he quickly followed his statement referring to her troubles and love. She has been married many times. He doesn't give us any reason of why the marriage has failed, um, but one would infer from the preceding epigraph that because of her beauty and how it was men's only desire to have her as a prize more than a person, so she may have just had this uh, indignant attitude towards marriage and men altogether. We don't know. Um, old men remind her that a few years back they rode her hobby horse upon their knees. Corintha smiles and indulges them when she is in the mood for it. She has contempt for them. Now we see Corintha finally ripen and the men beginning to take pleasure and satisfaction on sexual desire that they held for her in her youth. But you also see that Corintha, now a woman, is no longer impressed or interested in men in such a way. Her youth already gone and these experiences have been mastered so early she holds disdain for men. Corintha, who was once preyed on, becomes the now predator. She now trades with these men, um, taking advantage of their desire and creating a living from it. So Corintha, Corintha becomes a prostitute, to say the least, right? So it says, um, young men run fields to make her money. Young men go to big cities and run on the road. Young men go away to college. They all want to bring her money. So these were, these were the young men who thought all they had to do was count time. So now it says, just as old man Corintha is not oppressed, she has become a woman and has found men weakness to, to her and utilized it for personal gain here. Corintha is now a prostitute, but has done something more dreadful than just that. In the next stanza, Tuma reveals more of Corintha's nature. She had had a child at this point. So she has a child. It says, and if she had a child, a child fell out of her womb onto a bed of pine needles in the forest. So Tumor, uh, and it says, Tumor then alludes to the way Corintha murdered the child at the sawmill. So in this thing where he says, smoke is on the hills, smoke is on the hills, oh rise and take my soul to Jesus. He's pretty much implying that she buried and killed her child and hid it in the sawdust mill. And it says in the final paragraph, um, it's, it's shorter than all the others and it's rephrasing of the earlier stated sentences. Again, it says, Tuma repeats, Corintha is a, a woman now. Men do not know that the soul of her was a growing thing ripened too soon. So he says her soul is like ripened fruit, has now begun to rot. This is a restatement of the last line in the first paragraph and it emphasizes that this has begun to occur in Corintha's youth, right? when she was pressured to mature and grow or ripen before her time. And now that her time has come, she's already begun to ripe. Like before she's ready to be picked, to be really married, to be a, to be a mature woman, her, 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 her heart is already tainted by the world. And then Tumor ends the poem stating only her name and an ellipsis, then repetition of the epigraph, but this time ending it with the words, goes down. Uh, so when the sun goes down, right? A hit at the inevitable defeat of Corintha who was brought to maturity too soon and was used misused by men. So in conclusion, Corintha is the story of the conflict of woman versus man and the defeat of this woman because of the constant pressure and desire men have placed upon her all her life. She existed through the men who courted her, her unequal state and large gender issues and social barriers examine the lack of women's rights here. Men selfishly destroyed her youth and she was forced to partake in her society's expectation of reproductive things. So, Corintha is representation, representative of many women, right? Whom were so suppressed that their rights were nearly non-existent during this time. And the ending is tumors emphasizing of her defeat. Basically, her feat is uh, due to the societal expectations her inability to satisfy these desires that are placed on her or by satisfying them how they have a consequential effect on her heart anyway i'm so happy i got to get this love it. so happy i got to get this done today yeah i like corintha i like pain um he's kind of considered like the king of modernism and so corintha is a powerful story um it's difficult to understand at first but it is truly moving 
and in fact it's a couple stories there that can really it's a small novella I think it's like 120 pages but it, there are a lot of stories there that can really have you thinking and what's interesting is that even though he was writing during the Harlem Renaissance and he was considered African American he really tried to make a statement about what it meant to be American and to try to separate himself from this idea of colored Negro type of um, talk and so he tried to really speak out for that that mixed heritage that a lot of people were going through in the state of Georgia, Louisiana, and stuff like that. So, John Toomer's Kane, that's what it was. I hope that you enjoyed this video. Of course, if you do, please like, subscribe, comment. It means the world to me. Have a great day. Hey.